Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club. My name is Pam Carlin. I'm the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law and the founder and co-director of Stanford Law School's Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. It's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Wilde Anderson, my colleague here, a professor of property, local government, and environmental justice at Stanford Law School, and the author of the book, The Fight to Save the Town, Reimagining Discarded America. Michelle is the chair of the board of directors of the National Housing Law Project, and she's a board member at the East Bay Community Law Center in Oakland. She also holds a joint appointment with Stanford's new Door School of Sustainability. Before we get started, I'd like to encourage those of you tuning in to submit any questions for Michelle through the chat on YouTube. Michelle, welcome. <laughs> um, there's a saying of former Governor Mario Cuomo's about politics that we campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. Your book, with en which ends with your quoting a poem that was written during a time of tremendous economic and political ferment a century ago in one of the jurisdictions that you profile bridges that gap, I think, in language that is often poetic and always elegant and moving. You confront us with a reality about places and the people who live there who've been left behind. Now, I know Michelle worked really hard on all of the book, but she actually worked very hard on the title as well. And it helps to capture what this project has been all about. So why don't you give us a quick overview of the problem that you pose in the book and that you focus on? Thank you so much, Pam. I thank you so much for being here tonight, fresh off of your tour of duty at the Department of Justice. I feel like you've been involved in the fight to save the nation. We're talking about the fight to save the town today um, and really the way that the federal and state and local politics have to sort of work together to recover a version of democracy for all of us. So thank you for being here and thank you to the Commonwealth Club and Cara and Mark and Adam and others for making this happen. And to any of you who managed to find time on a Monday night to be here, that's kind of a miracle. Um, so the title, Pam, um, thank you for asking about it. I did go through about 16 drafts of what the title should be. And the final one has two parts. It's kind of the problem part and the solution part. The fight to save the town is the solution that we're gonna to get to. Um, but the problem part, the discarded America part is really centers on a kind of core um, issue. And I'm gonna do my, go into teacher mode and pull up a few super quick slides, just five slides um, to uh, give the audience their bearings on this particular problem that I work on. Um, so that problem is that um, the United Na the United States has become a nation of local government haves and have nots, and I think it's poetic that Pam and I are talking with you from the city of Palo Alto, which serves as an amazing teaching device for thinking about this this particular problem. Um, this here is uh, the main branch of a gorgeous Palo Alto library that was rebuilt with a $76 million bond measure um, approved in 2008 and took a few years to um, rebuild several of the um, public libraries to become state of the art in terms of public space and Wi-Fi and children's programming um, and uh, so forth. And for those of you who don't know, Palo Alto is a city of about 67,000 people. Um, Meanwhile, so many of the workers that staff this university, our food service, our hospital, so many of the services that sort of pulse through a giant university community like this, and so many of the tech businesses across Palo Alto and Silicon Valley, that workforce often comes in from the city of Stockton and other um, uh, northern Central Valley towns. Um, Stockton's population is 
about four and a half times bigger than Palo Alto. And this is a picture of one of its libraries when it was um, thriving. This is a Harry Potter book release party at the Fair Oaks Library in 2007. Um, but this um, important bedroom community for our workforce went through a round of devastating budget cuts, including the closure of this library because of um, layoffs of staff and this giant 46% um, library staff um, layoff round that the uh, system went through. Um, and meanwhile, Stockton's budget, even now, is only about $2 million more for its library than in Palo Alto, even though the city, as I said, is four and a half times bigger. Um, and uh, this is a picture of what the library looks like when it's got no children and families in it. And in fact, this became an encampment for much of the um, period of its closure, um, just uh, stopped providing this really important supplemental education function. And that matters so much to basic inequality. Because when you think about the educational performance of the two school districts that these libraries cover, um, in Palo Alto, 79% of students at the district are testing at the proficient level for reading, while only 27% of the kids in the Stockton Unified District are reaching that same level. In fact, Stockton is identified as a true crisis in literacy in California um, that, uh, you know, arguably more than anywhere, relies on libraries for all the people who can't have private book collections like I do behind me or home computers and Wi-Fi and um, and so forth. So this is a little um, vignette of sort of the local government haves and have nots. And this is not just about libraries. This is also about emergency services, including 911 dispatch. This is a headline um, from Josephine County, Oregon, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, uh, that was um, run actually around the world. This is one of the headlines that appeared in the UK. Um, Woman choked and raped by ex-boyfriend after dispatcher informs her there are no cops to help and instead tells her to ask her attacker to leave. And this was referred reflective of a uh, massive staffing um, uh, layoff round, um, just like in the library example. Last but not least, this cartoon from The New Yorker years ago was a very cynical um, cartoon reflecting subscription services in fire protection, um, but this is not a flight of fancy. We now have many places that are under kind of opt-in fire regimes. Um, and this is, uh, we developed the world of fire protection as a public service back at the end of the first gilded age of inequality. And here we are finding ourselves back into a world where it's not a public default. It's something that you purchase a la carte with money out of your own pocket. Um, the, the, this is my um, second to last slide, just this quick overview of the project, um, that the underlying condition that Stockton and Josephine and Optin fire protection counties share is that they have lots of poverty all across their tax base. They have not only really high rates of, of um, concentrated poverty that is defined as one in five people who live under the poverty line of $26,000 a year for a family of four. And I'm just going to pause and encourage you tonight to try and make a family budget of $26,000 a year for a family of four in California because our poverty rate in this state, statewide, we end up with 13 to 15% of our people in this state living on that um, income level. The places I write about have at least 20% of their people living under that line. Um, and they also have a low median income, which means they're not like really rich neighborhoods and really poor neighborhoods. They're kind of flat working class, lower income all across the town. And that's why I called it in the book, Border to Border Poverty. Last slide is just to say that this creates this dynamic in which places with all of this concentrated, packed in border to border poverty are very likely to become broke, meaning that they don't take in enough revenues to support basic services and meet needs in town. 
And being broke makes it harder for people to get out of poverty. And here we can just remember that library example. It is harder for people to climb out of poverty when the government around them is failing to invest in their kids, their you know, adult education and so forth. So I am gonna stop my slides there to just um, re, you know, touch back with the title of the, the book is you know, Reimagining Discarded America, really showing up for this, this particular type of poverty and really thinking about what we're gonna do about those giant areas of the country that have not found a foothold in the modern service economy and are dealing with this kind of sinking, sagging um, tax base. So your book, Michelle, is a book that follows the advice of one of the greatest uh, current lawyers for justice, Brian Stevenson, who says, the important thing is for people to get proximate, to get near to the problem that they're dealing with. And you're talking about a national story here, but you really drill down on four jurisdictions. Um, some of them are famous, Detroit. I'm sure that there's no one in our audience tonight who's not heard of Detroit. Um, some of them are familiar to people in the Bay Area. Stockton, the example you were just giving before is very, you know, every, I think everybody in the Bay Area knows Stockton. But some of these are places that probably virtually none of us, I know this is true for me, even knew existed before uh, I read your book, like Josephine uh, County, Oregon. And it, these are all places that at one point were vibrant communities. They were vibrant during the era in which America was a manufacturing, uh, manufacturing economy, Detroit and automobiles, uh, Lawrence and textiles, um, Josephine County and lumber. Um, but they're not thriving today. So can you tell us a little bit about these places and how it is you came to choose them? Yeah, that Stevenson quote is amazing, Pam. So beautiful and so true to what I had kind of hoped for in this project, because I'll just say off script, it must be said that uh, getting to sit with four really American towns like this were so different from each other was just a gift and it humanized this problem for me and I hope that I pass that on to readers. Um, yeah, I mean, I really hope you give people a sense uh, in your answer to this question of what it is you did to learn about these communities because it's so different than I think the average academic work. This is really a, a, a work of deep proximity to the places. That's so lovely of you to say. Well, I I would just say, first of all, you asked about choosing them, and I'll get to how I um, did it in a minute, but, but choosing them, I really wanted to hold places that were really different from each other along the dimensions of difference that are true to this problem. So in other words, the book, I really felt compelled that the book had to hold places that were super rural, but also super urban and small company towns, because a lot of deindustrialization comes from places that used to have a big manufacturing core and you know um, have, have fallen into being primarily residential. Um, so urban to rural, but also super red to super blue to swing places like Stockton. Um, and then lastly, to hold the the, um, inc the full spectrum of racial difference in these towns. So you get this problem of border to border poverty in places that are all black, all Latino, or all white, or as in Stockton's case, the most diversity in the United States of America, which I just have to like, you know, put an exclamation mark over how important it is for us to understand as Americans, like that city and, and as, as Californians, sort of how it became that diverse and how to, you know, govern a place with that kind of global um, story behind it, you know, refugee and immigration lines from all over the world. Um, so, so in part, I chose them for their differences, um, but I also chose them because the people in these towns were so generous and open. I mean, it must be said that these four places, um, to a greater extent than others that um, I worked with, just kind of let me in. And I think one of the reasons they let me in is because they recognized, because I told them strenuously at the outset, that I was not there to write more ruin porn. And this is a sort of term of art that comes actually from photography, but I think is apt here. This kind of voyeuristic um, reporting in which we tell stories about poor places like 
bullets flying and corrupt politicians and we rank them on most miserable places to live in America and so forth. And that kind of deeply stigmatizing reporting really sets insiders back. But I think it also gives outsiders like, you know, me, not a resident of these cities, I live in San Francisco, gives us an excuse to not really engage in the project of reinvestment because there's this story that we tell ourselves that it's so broken that it can't be fixed. Um, and so you kind of give up. And so these were really special because they're progressing on some of the hardest issues in poverty today. Um, and I think they were just so gracious at sort of letting me in so that I could pass that story back out. So, you know, one of the things that you, you showed kind of in your in your slides at, at the end was, you know, the lack of police protection in Josephine and the lack of fire protection in some parts of the country. And your work's an important lesson that we're not really entitled to public services. I mean, the, the, a lot of the story in your book is the story of the lack of public services, the lack, for example, of mental health care for much of the period you're talking about in Stockton or the lack of police altogether in many parts of uh, many parts of Josephine uh, County or the like. And it, I, I think this might surprise a lot of people who think about like, what are your rights as an American? Yeah, I, it's so important. And that is a really important teachable moment about local government law in general that you know so well, Pam, inside and out, that the federal constitution doesn't give us lots of affirmative rights. And even states don't give us or affirmative entitlements to government, I should say. Um, the, but even states really only guarantee K-12 to education. So really, it's politics, not law, not the not state constitutions, not state statutes. It's politics that make us able to take fire protection for granted. It's politics that makes me able to assume that when I pick up that phone and call 911, a person who answers it is going to have access to emergency services on my behalf. And those are assumptions that we build in through um, through democracy and we build in through our tax system. And I think in the post-war period, this, this reality in law was hidden. It just didn't matter that much because states took in lots of revenues and then they passed them back out. So everybody could have 911 regardless of how poor you were. But really since the 1980s, that commitment to redistributing income regardless of poverty level has really been chipped away systematically. And so we're now 40 years in to the withdrawal of really serious um, uh, redistributive uh, aid that would make it kind of irrelevant whether you lived in Stockton or Palo Alto for whether you had access to a library in your neighborhood. And um, so I think we're out of that that era. COVID had this little bump, a surge in local government revenues that was out of step with this larger period. But as people know, that those revenues were emergency measures because we had a pandemic and local governments had like all kinds of emergency um, responsibilities related to public health and a collapse in all kinds of revenues. So anyway, we're in this longer decline. So it matters a lot that we don't have a legal entitlement. You know, Pam and I are speaking to you from a law school and I would just summarize this by saying, there's no one to sue. Like there's no anchor in text, well, you know, in well, constitutional I mean, text the, or statute. Yeah, I mean, the other thing which I think you talk about this at various points in the book is just how um, how local governments get their money, which is much of that money, it's sales taxes and property taxes, right? And can you say a little bit about just how those operate? Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean, first of all, folks should know that, you know, how a local government raises its money is um, a, a rule held by state law. Our states decide, can a local government have an income tax or not? If they have a property tax, how much? If they have a sales tax, who gets the revenues from that, et cetera? So states are in charge of a lot of those rules. Um, 
And uh, but as a general matter, if you kind of make generalizations across the 50 states, it's nonetheless true that property taxes and sales taxes are really important to local revenues. And increasingly and very unfortunately, local governments, especially in very poor places, rely more and more on fees. So things that they take from people for civil tickets or for, you know, court costs or other kinds of things. So local governments. And that was a big issue in, in Ferguson was, right. you know, the where a lot of the racial unrest in the in 2014-15 occurred was that they were making most of their money off of fining people. And then when people couldn't pay the fine, uh, imposing fees on top of that and court costs on top of that. And that was essentially how they were raising money. Exactly. And, you know, side note of how just for a moment and for the audience, just as a matter of history to just observe how the Ferguson street protests that really led to a lot of the investigative journalism that led to a lot of the think tank reports and lawsuits and so forth really triggered this larger reckoning with this world of hidden fees. And every state very much, including California, now has kind of faced the reality of these fees that are sort of all across poor cities and the, the number of places in the country that are kind of wringing dollars out of the poorest Americans pockets. Um, yes. So and again, you know, we there are lots of suburbs in that northern bank of St. Louis suburbs alongside Ferguson who um, who were taking fees in this incredibly abusive manner. But I would just say at the end of the day, to me, the buck lies with Missouri, who left those local governments to die. So it cannot be a story simply of kind of mismanagement at the at the local level. So one of the chapters of your book, the chapter on Josephine captures, I think, really powerfully this bottoming out of, of services. Um, you know, if you think about the national conversation or the coverage in the media, when they talk about defunding the police, it's usually thought of as something that uh, people on the left are asking for, you know, abolish the police department, defund the police. Um, but in fact, the defunding of the police that you write about in your book occurs in Josephine, which is an extraordinarily red, conservative, overwhelmingly white rural county. And it's not done as a matter of um, defund the police because the police are abusive. It's done for really quite a different, it, quite a different underlying sentiment to it. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how it's almost as if the left side and the right side have come around towards each other in their distrust of and unwillingness to fund the government. Yeah, I mean, you did that with your hands, Pam, and I often think about that, that sometimes I think of politics now having written this book as sort of more like a horseshoe than a line where there's something at the far right and the far left, there is a sort of convergence. And some of that convergence is over skepticism of government, the desire for privacy to sort of try to make it across poverty um, without, uh, you know, child protective services officers and others, um, you know, without the sort of larger apparatus of, of um, enforcement, including police. Um, and so, uh, you know, the story in Josephine County is really one of, of a certain amount of degradation in people's relationship to government in general, in that sense. But then it's also, and, and some recent mismanagement at the sheriff's department that made people skeptical of their, you know, their prior um, leaders. Um, but then also just the fact that in the 90s, Oregon had developed this elaborate tax structure that makes it really hard for local governments to raise any money. And so the truth is they had one tax election after another at the local level and small um, majorities of the population would vote it down. And then the 43 percent, 45 percent who wanted increased law enforcement um, was voted down. And the story that I tell in Josephine is really one of a kind of grassroots campaign to rebuild the um, rebuild emergency services. Because just like you said, they went through a very radical experiment of what it's like to lose 
all kinds of addiction services and mental health services and social services, and then also lose police. It's a, it's really important to emphasize they lost all this other stuff first and then police is kind of the last thing standing and then they lose that too. And in the context of the opioid crisis raging in rural America, that's scary for people. Um, so, you know, there was- yeah, I mean, that chapter in your book opens with a, a domestic homicide in which there's no investigation for a long time. There's obviously no way she could have called 911. Yeah, and that story, I think, really is this amazing window into what you could think of as like the um, the anti-snitch politics of urban America, of sort of people really not trusting police officers in rural places. And so this kind of larger battle, you know, the government's got no money, it's got no staff, and it has this population that is used to the government failing it. I mean, that's the bottom line. If somebody from Josephine was in my shoes right now, they would say, we didn't give the government, we didn't want to give the government more money because the government never is there for us. It never has our back. We'll give it two, two years of funding and then that'll withdraw and I'll be left in this same sort of situation. So there's a larger backstory, I think, to what we could you know, lots of people, including some who, you know, have read my work before, sort of throw the book at Josephine and say, you know, well, they get what they pay for, right? They won't approve taxes. And so, you know, when you pick up the call to call 911, that's what you get. But it's a much more complicated story about faith and democracy and faith in government, I think. So, I mean, one of the things you're also talking about, and I think this overall theme is what you just alluded to, is that you have to rebuild democracy and trust in government uh, from below. It's not just something that can come from Washington or come from Sacramento or, uh, you know, come from Salem, I guess, in, 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 in Oregon. It, it comes from other places as well. So how do you, how do you go about rebuilding that? Trust? I mean, that's the fight to save the town, right? We've, we've sort of been talking up until now about the people who are left behind, but how do you, how do you go about doing that kind of rebuilding? What have you learned from the work you've done on the book? Yeah, I mean, that really became um, the very big picture of the book. I thought that I was writing about emergency services in Josephine and trauma care in Stockton to prevent gun violence and the foreclosure disaster in Detroit and so forth. I thought I was writing about these specific pillars that make poverty so hard. But above all of these is this larger retreat of basic faith in the state and really the kind of scarcity politics that from the street level, you know, may, and nonprofits and all the way up the chain make people no longer trust each other. So what I mean is, you know, at, in a very high crime area, you get this erosion of basic trust in strangers, like a person walking down the sidewalk. Is it safe for me to be in a park, et cetera? You get nonprofits that are scrapping for dollars and going head to head, fighting constantly, always, you know, competing with each other in negative ways. You get local government elections um, where, you know, the larger public is not turning out and not engaged. Um, and then, so that's going on at the local level. And then meanwhile, up at the federal and state levels, as you captured, there's all kinds of other things that people are angry about, whether it's environmental law or, um, or fear of immigration enforcement from federal authorities. So people associate the state with these federal policies and they, you know, and they don't see a kind of real presence of, of, um, of government in any form that's kind of looking out for them and their families, like trying to make their lives, um, make their lives better. So I think that's the very big picture. And I'm kind of dying to ask you, Pam, having been at DOJ and, you know, it must be said sort of at a moment with the January 6th insurrection and the larger turbulence and risk in American democracy, if you buy the argument in the book that we can at some level sort of repair government up the chain, that it's important that we trust our government locally as part of this larger erosion and trust in federal and state governments. I mean, I think it goes in both in both directions, right? Which is, um, you know, if you think about most people's most 
direct experience of democracy is going to be in their own communities. It's going to be not just even voting for, um, you know, government officials, not just voting for mayor or city council, but also things like voting in their neighborhood associations, voting for leadership of their churches, voting for, uh, you know, leadership in their unions and the loss of union democracy, I think, uh, and the loss of unions has had a major effect. You know, people's experience of democracy in their workplaces, if they're if they're working. So that's a place where you have to rebuild trust. And then, of course, you also have to rebuild it top down at the same time. And it's a it's a it's a difficult thing to do. I mean, I I keep thinking about um, you know eras in American history when there was that feeling of responsive national responsibility for local problems. Um, and now you know you see. Something is quite different from that. I mean, you know, the horrific flying of uh, migrants to Martha's Vineyard, you know, or the, you know, putting children in cages, uh, the, fail the failure to care about what happens in, in other states when they're facing wildfires or they're facing drought or they're facing flooding. Um, there is, I think, this need, as, as you say at several points in the book, for people to set, have more of a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the, you know, as I was reading the book, I was kind of oscillating back and forth between hope and despair, hope and despair, hope and despair. <laughs> um, and, and the places where I found the most hope were where people were kind of organizing at the local level to pursue one or two things at that local level that they thought they really could accomplish. So, you know, in... Um, in Josephine, it's the I guess it's the vote on the library bond mm -hmm. and the voluntary the voluntary patrols. Mm -hmm. In um, in Lawrence, it's the teaching people to be paraprofessionals in the school system. Could you talk about a couple of those? Where they came from, and you know, are they scalable in any way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, first of all, that's so well said about sort of needing to rebuild it up and down. And I really think that's true. And I, you know, so often in reporting this book, I really felt called back to Tocqueville and sort of political theory ideas about how we learn democracy. And it's always been a thesis of American political theory, as you captured it, that part of what we need is a robust civil society, whether it's at the union floor or local town council or whatever, where we actually practice democracy. And because I teach environmental justice, I'm very aware of the ways that in, engagement and civic society and even civic confrontation to really, um, you know, demand better from our leaders are also, you know, part of how we, you know, deal with the educational divide and we inculcate sort of new generations of leadership, more diverse racially and socioeconomically. Um, so we need these larger sort of, um, or we need these smaller, I should say, these smaller sort of settings where we learn the sort of tools of democracy. And, you know, as you say, the the I think this, the takeaway lesson from Josephine to me is that, which I don't know how to think about this at the federal level, but at the local level, part of what worked to sort of finally break through the roadblock on getting new revenues locally and thus release more support from the state was to really go to the people in town halls and and um, uh, really go through what can only be called sort of a, um, a confrontational, almost restorative process in which local government officials kind of faced people's anger over past confrontations with police or faced um, skepticism of how government resources were being used. You know, we have, we are just saturated, especially in conservative information channels, saturated with news about how government misuses or wastes taxpayer dollars. So if you want to get past that, like you've got to create a pie chart for your budget and like really talk about what you do with that money and how many miles are on your cruisers. And I think that that kind of really granular detail sort of released people's skepticism about government and they um, 
helped people sort of approve taxes um, really based on a much more clear understanding of what they'd be used for. And then in Lawrence, Massachusetts, this incredible mill town in Massachusetts, I was so privileged to work on, um, they built this larger training apparatus that attached to the public school system and all of its jobs, and then the big central hospital in the city. And they were really investing, they asked this totally audacious question, which is without unions, as you said, without unions, how could you get the parents of public school kids in the city of Lawrence a 15% raise? How do you do that? And you can't just, they're working all over the place. They're nannies and janitors and they're working, they're fueling the Route 128, you know, tech economy outside Boston Metro. They've got, you know, all kinds of low wage jobs all over the place. So you can't strike, you can't, you know, do it through unionization. You can't even pass a living wage ordinance. So instead they built this larger, um, uh, this larger, um, connective tissue among all of the, the local institutions, the vocational school, the community college, the government, the mayor's office, in order to, you know, to train Lawrence residents, who, by the way, are the bilingual Latino residents that the hospital and the schools were dying to hire, how to train them into this job base. And that was better for the schools, it's better for the hospitals, but, you know, who had tons of turnover and open positions, but it was also, you know, this incredible effort to raise local wages. And the truth so is, is a place the places, yeah. I mean, Lawrence is a place where the jobs are there, but the people need the skills and the, you know, the, the credentials to right. get those jobs. Josephine seems to be quite different in that way. That is, the jobs are not there. And you talk at a couple of points in the book about, you know, people just assumed, well, everybody will move to the jobs, but people don't, don't do that. And the poorer they are, while, the, while poor people are more mobile in the sense that they're more housing insecure, they move to different places, um, they are less mobile in the sense of moving to where opportunity is now than they were, for example, at the time of the Great Migration that fueled Detroit or at the time that immigrants first started going to places like Lawrence. Yeah, no, that's 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 all so that's all so true. So. Um... Wait, Pam, rewind to the very beginning of what you said, because that was what I wanted to pick up on, and then I lost the thread. Sorry. So that, what I said is that in Lawrence, the jobs are there. Oh, yes. And sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's what I wanted to pick up on. So I'm so sorry. Yes. So in some ways, that's true. And in some ways, it's not true. Or it's true, but it doesn't have to remain true. So what I mean by that is... Josephine, for example, all of Southern Oregon is has a major economic development play to make over the aging of California retirees who want into the preferable tax structure of Oregon taxes. They want to basically get out of California taxes and it's a gorgeous region. And so there's this sort of larger ambition in Southern Oregon in general to attract California retirees. In order to do that, you gotta have a caregiver workforce that's ready for elder care. And so they have, so yes, they don't have that workforce now, but the truth is there is a path to jobs in the region, but it's got to travel through the same kind of credentialing and education that you referenced before. And the truth is, I think most places are like that. It's not that they couldn't build a durable job sector in town. It's that they but are going a lot to be, of steps. How, how, do, how do you turn those jobs into good jobs, right? I yeah. mean, I, I know one of the things, uh, not that I worked on at DOJ, but that we've helped represent people in our clinic in is the fact that caregiver jobs in America are low wage, high turnover, difficult jobs and becoming a kind of tax haven for folks from California who want to go someplace where the taxes are low. That's just what you've told us is the problem in Josephine is the taxes are low. Right. No, that's very that's very true. But I mean, here is where I think none of these local solutions happen without 
change at the federal level too. And, you know, this administration has been part of a really once in a generation effort to recognize caregiving as a living wage path of employment. And so, you know, the truth is that there are pieces of that problem that I think you have to go after at other scales. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it is a better quality of life to be a, you know, a low, a caregiver in a lower cost of living place than it is to be here in Palo Alto. And so that's in terms of commute times, housing costs, and so forth. I mean, that's a generalization. But, you know, in general, the truth is that those jobs, um, you know, they, they've got to, um, they've got to move. And as to your larger, um, or they have to be able to move, I guess. As to your last point about, um, you know, the tax structure in Oregon is part of the problem, Definitely true. And here's where the state really matters too. you know, at no point in this book, do I ever say and I hope I strenuously argue against it, that, you know, local governments like they've got this. Like that is not the point of this book. The point of this book is that all three of these tiers of government have to be actively engaged and we have to care about these places and these people and these problems um, at the state and federal level too. So one of, one of the things I, I, I wanted to talk about a little bit more is Detroit, um, which is a different set of problems. And, 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 and um, you know, Detroit is a, a housing crisis on top of a jobs crisis. And some of the statistics you give are just stunning. The, you know, the churn in housing, the number of people who are evicted every year, the incredibly cheap housing, uh, and the churn in that as well. So what happened in Detroit? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked about that. I, um, I want to just say that this really, Detroit, like housing policy in Silicon Valley here, really reminds us that inequality is its own kind of problem. This story in my book is not just a poverty story. There's a way in which Detroit has this weird, you know, out, weird reality, which you can find all across the Rust Belt, that it's hard for people to get their head around. How could you have land that is just, by our standards, like, dirt cheap, you know, $2,000 for a parcel or whatever. How could that coexist with a devastating homelessness and eviction crisis and a foreclosure crisis? Like that just makes no sense. Like if you just operate in kind of- Yeah, because you think, well, if it's so cheap, everybody should yeah. be able to afford it. Yeah. Right. And so I think it's, it's a deep reminder. What happens in Detroit and the larger story I tell is that as the, and this is partly a climate change um, a sort of fact that a lot of speculative capital has gone into Rust Belt real estate because they've got water and we're in like the drought and fire belt. And there's a lot of speculation that specifically Detroit will come back or is coming back, but also that all of the Great Lakes region, it is our patrimony of fresh water. And so it's got to come back. It's got to have some kind of future over the long run. And so you've got these giant real estate portfolios. You know, I just picture them like hungry computers, like just sucking up these gigantic, what are called blight bundles, you know, hundreds of parcels all at once into these big portfolios. You've got that phenomenon, which again is an inequality phenomenon, not just a people are so poor that even a cheap house is out of their reach. We got an inequality problem, but then meanwhile, there's this second dimension too, which is that the larger um, structure of Detroit's government as it went through just total crisis and laid off all its staff and everything, made it easier for people to buy houses in bulk because you know, you're just trying to clear your roles. You're just trying to manage the sort of administrative crisis. Detroit is a really important reminder that things like or you know, jobs like tax assessors, that job has to be staffed and it has to be fair. And the, you know, the people at the the um land holding offices of the city government that are trying to move their roles, you know, they've got to have the kind of basic administration, including like functional technology and, you know, um uh uh, you know, just adequate equipment so that they can um, do their job in some way other than just like emergency crisis management. The bottom line is that Detroit, as you captured, is still in the middle of what is 
the most devastating foreclosure crisis I can even imagine. And this city that we think of, I think, in the sort of deep American imagination as sort of the capital of the Black middle class, because Detroit was really so important to the building of a Black middle class, and just the sort of our middle class imaginary in general, or middle class period of our country in general, has become really just the poster child for American inequality. And it has gone from being a majority Black homeowner city to being a majority Black tenant city across this period. So it's a devastating crisis. And, and because it's complex with all of these layers of investment and real estate and administration and all of that, it's taken this incredible social movement of people, of journalists and lawyers and activists and you know, university researchers and others to really figure out like what is going on? How could we have so much cheap land and yet have this unbelievable once in a generation like divestment of black home ownership in this really important city? So um like you said, it oscillates between hope and despair. Many days working on Detroit, I felt lots of despair over the facts, but lots of hope over the people and their kind of tenacious refusal to sort of accept um, to accept the status quo. Yeah, I, I, I thought one of the things, one of the stories in the book that was so interesting to me is you tell the story of going to uh, the, the eviction court in Detroit and the first time you show up, um, you can't get in because you have a, a, a um, makeup compact with you. And so you go outside and what was it, the mirror in the compact was the problem. So you go outside and you rip the cover off the compact and throw the cover in the trash. And then the second day when you go back, they, they let you in and you say that you thought to yourself, you know, obviously for you, you know, throwing away the top of the mirror compact means nothing. If it really bothered you, you just go out and buy another one. But you tell the story in a way where you empathize with the people who are there to be evicted who think to themselves, I don't have a lot of possession. Now you're telling me I have to throw out my mirror or I can't go into the courthouse to plead to be given a little extra time. And it reminds us that, you know, this is a book, you're a law professor. This is a book in which there's not a lot of law, right? <laughs> I mean, there's not a lot of law in the book. It's not a book about the re about redlining in Detroit. It's not uh, a book about, um, you know, guns policy and the Second Amendment or like, but the one place where there's law and the one place where law comes back into these people's lives is to take stuff away from them. I mean, law doesn't actually give them very much, but it takes a lot away, it takes away their liberty. Um, you know, the last thing standing um, in a lot of these places is fines and fees. It takes away their houses. They're not represented by lawyers. Um, I mean, how did you think about law as you were working your way through this project? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think about it as government. So, I mean, the big picture is that, you know, this book is, I feel like law is power and power is government. And so at some level, this book, I, I do, sometimes I thought I didn't belong in this building anymore, but most days I thought, no, it's okay. We can focus on how we govern and the sort of functioning of democracy around here as you do. Um, so heroically in your career. Um, so uh, so that's the sort of big picture. The story about getting into the eviction court, I mean, just for the story, the whole story is at the end of the book, but it you know took me three hours in total to get into the building. Um, and, uh, you know, like you said, the compact didn't matter at all, though it's really notable that you can't even have a mirror in the courtroom. It's that the trash can is full of earphones and pens and food and water bottles and all these other things that people had bust toward this courthouse and had to throw away because like me, they went through this whole long exhaustive line, got to the front and got booted out. And the point of the story was really that this process of just entering a court of law was really humiliating, annoying, and incredibly time consuming. And yet that courthouse manages to evict 30,000 people a year. And so when people look around a city like Detroit that has become infamous for 911 wait times and, you know, libraries overgrown with plants and, you know, just the collapse in public services, law is still present 
like you said, it's still, you know, got a um, very high arrest rate. It's still moving evictions and foreclosures through the system. And so um, it really, that's where if we go back to that horseshoe shaped rot in our relationship to government, the far left deserves to be on that list too, because people in very poor places do not trust local government to have their back. The difference between Detroit and um, Josephine, I think, is that as a political matter, you know, there is this underlying faith that it can be repaired. And I think sometimes on the far right that, you know, there's a big segment of Josephine these days that I don't think can be convinced that government could be sort of rebuilt. And in Detroit, that that candle still burns. This like belief that we could fix its problems, we can make it better. Um, and, you know, but it takes people to do that work. You know, that's where the practice of democracy is. Um, well, it's a practice. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when you say the, the candle still burns there, I mean, it, it, as I said at the beginning, this is a poetic book. And as I read it, I kind of oscillated between hope and despair. So I thought I might transition us into the questions from the audience by quoting uh, from W.H. Auden's poem, September 1st, 1939. Um, which uses imagery oddly like what you just said, which is, uh, he writes, there's no such thing as the state and no one exists alone. Hunger allows no choice to the citizen or the police. We must love one another or die. Defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies. Yet dotted everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. And in this book, I think you show us a number of those affirming flames uh, for which we should be really quite grateful. Um, so we have a bunch of questions that have come in from the audience and I'll ask you uh, as many of them as we can, as, as, as we can get to. Um, one of the questions that we got asked is, um, during your research in these various places, was there anything that it really surprised you to learn? That you uh, that you think people should know more about. Um, well, thank you first of all for that poem. That was so beautiful. It just gave me chills. Um, I feel like I need to call up my heart emoji on the Zoom screen. Um, so beautiful. So something that surprised me. I mean, you know, in some ways, things surprise me every single day because if you listen to the stories that we tell about these places. Um, uh, you know, they just don't line up with what's going on in town. And I'll give one really small example of this. Lawrence in Massachusetts politics is heavily stigmatized and former President Trump, along with governors of New Hampshire and Maine, have blamed Lawrence for the New England opioid crisis. Um, years ago, the Boston Magazine referred to Lawrence as the city of the damned. The most, they, and I continue to quote, the most godforsaken city in Massachusetts. And that kind of language, this sort of piling on of stigma, makes, you know, the first time I went into Lawrence, like that's what, if you read about Lawrence, you get a lot of that kind of pathologizing. And, and, um, and then you get there, and Lawrence is this. Uh, mostly Latino town with a heavy with heavy roots in the Caribbean. And one of the things I noticed first, in addition to how many people, you know, dress up their kids just so beautifully for church on the weekends, is how many people hold hands all over the place. Like I live in frosty San Francisco. We don't hold hands on sidewalks. And in Lawrence, like people hold hands with their kids, adults hold hands with each other, friends hold hands. You know, I think it's just a Caribbean like affection. I couldn't meet a single Caribbean leader there without them like doing the, you know, European kisses thing. And so it's this really affectionate, warm city. And um, not once did anybody offer to sell me drugs or, you know, do any of the things that even the New York Times in its reporting on Lawrence would lead you to believe happen every time you pull up to a stop sign. So I guess the big picture answer is that one thing that surprised me is that if you get off the beaten path and you go toward these places that are so heavily stigmatized, um, you know, there are a lot of surprises every day. So an, another question that we got is, I, I'm sure something that a lot of people are thinking about, which is, it's one thing to cure these problems in the places that, you know, in the places that, uh, as the title of the book talks about, have been discarded 
But how do we avoid discarding places in the first place? I mean, one of the questions is, you know, are there way, are there preventative measures that every community should be taking so that it doesn't end up in the position where it has to dig itself out of the holes that Stockton or Lawrence or Detroit or Josephine County found themselves in? What an amazing question, you know, to be answering in Silicon Valley, because, and I constantly thought of myself in that way, we're at this point in our history where we're like an industrial titan, and we've built lots of our, you know, our um, civic life around the expectation that that, you know, dominance will continue. And, you know, that's what Detroit thought and most industrial era, you know, cities really believed. And so the truth is, I think you do have to assume that, you know, you're not always on top. And to me, that results in the same lesson that you get in that I think is the bottom line lesson for very poor places, which is that you have to invest in your people. You have to invest in their education, including adults. You have to invest in their basic safety so that you don't deal with the levels of trauma that we see in a place like Stockton. And I mean safety, not just through police, but through larger um, you know, public safety interventions outside of the police departments. And um, so I think that there is this kind of bottom line that you have to assume that, um, that you know, the rosy days don't last forever. Um, and uh, and secondly, I would just say that- okay, When you say the rosy days, can I just stop you there for a minute? Because there's a, there's a on, on page 139 of your book, you're talking about what happened in the strike in Lawrence in 1912. And you quote a poem um, by James Oppenheim that talks about marching and marching. And then it says, our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. And how do, how, what are the preventative roses that we can be giving to people? Yeah, I, I think that poem is so beautiful. Um, it, uh, I think, you know, in the strike, it was really capturing that, you know, the fact that you had the bare necessities in terms of food was not enough to sort of call it a life. And the larger claim was to parks and open space and a childhood. I mean, roses in part in that era meant not being on the factory floor at age 13. So it was really about sort of giving people like feeding their minds and their hearts through arts and culture. And there too is an amazing surprise. I had this incredible moment in the city of Detroit early, early in reporting there. And I kind of assumed that if you ask people about what local government services are most important to them, they will never say arts and culture. That was kind of just an assumption I had, like on the pecking order of emergency need, like that doesn't make the top of the list. On the contrary, in Detroit, people constantly answer that kind of investment in art and, you know, that public art, music, sort of public spaces with music are part of why people are willing to put up with this level of decline and really part of the kind of vibrancy, the ongoing vibrancy of the city. And actually, as you burrow into it, you realize like Detroit has more free music than probably anywhere in America. And it is just this, it, to this day, this, I can't, I shouldn't say it has more free music than anywhere in America. What I will say is that that free music is very precious in a place that does not have, um, you know, that kind of, um, you know, that doesn't have sort of leisure time and ticketed entertainment that people can afford. So it's very precious. And so you realize that Detroit today, for all our pathologizing, is still the American music capital that it was famous for. I mean, it has been important to the history of American music, its whole history. That is still true. So to me, all of that is the roses. It's sort of investing in people and, um, you know, uh, you know, helping us to, to work together. In Josephine, there's an amazing theater program, a dance theater program that people really, for children, that people think of as part of healing trauma, of sort of allowing children who've grown up in situations of domestic violence to sort of heal their relationship with their body and sort of, um, uh, 
so it's part of a larger sort of effort. Um, but I think it is also just this opportunity for adults to sit together in town and watch a recital at the end of the semester. And that means that people will come together for that recital, whether they're for the tax levy or against, or you know, off the grid lefties or off the grid righties. And um, you know, it's kind of secular civic life. And, and yeah. you start you actually start the book with a really powerful image of that. It's the concert with the old band instruments just to show people, you know, we need, we need, we need better instruments. So I have time for maybe one or two more questions before we end. And one question that it groups a couple of the questions together is America today is very different than America two or three years ago. I mean, the, the years of COVID have shown us things like remote work. They've showed us you know, a, a number of other things about the country, about reinvestment and like. And do, does, does any of the experience of the last two years make you think about what you saw while you were doing the reporting for the book differently? Uh, are there different solutions now that might come from the, the Zoom world that you and I find ourselves on right here, even? Yeah, I, it, it's such a good question. And I have to say, it only reinforces how important everything else was in the years leading up to COVID. So if you, you know, I it, during the pandemic, we became so much more familiar with this language of mutual aid. And we really think of that as like, mano, you know, like, I buy your groceries, you know, when you can't go out or whatever. And this kind of these smaller networks of interdependency that allow us to survive a pandemic and protect our most vulnerable people. That idea of mutual aid is essential, especially in poor places all the time. And it's got to be built at the neighbor to neighbor level, at the block level, at the city level. And it's got to be built at the institutional level where, you know, the like I was saying before, the vocational school knows how to, you know, write a text to get something quickly from the mayor's office so that people are sort of working together because not everything can be done with cash. I mean, there's not a lot of money and, you know, cash couldn't solve our pandemic either. So there's a larger or at least, you know, can't like make it go away. So I think what happened in these cities, it was such a breathtaking window into the pandemic because people in all four of these places had been working so hard to sew the place back together that then when this terrible unforeseen thing happens, all of these networks like re-engage for that problem. So you see these larger like trust building efforts in Stockton, for instance, becoming the basis for checking on elderly people who are isolated, for distributing food and um and uh, protective equipment to undocumented farm workers and slaughterhouse and cannery workers who Californians remember are some of the, you know, took some of the heaviest losses and early waves of tragedy in the pandemic. So these networks got like redeployed to run information and emergency supplies out to people at a time of vulnerability. So um, yeah, same but different. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating to think about how much of this has to be done at the retail level. I mean, because your book is, a, is both about things that need to be done at the wholesale level. I mean, we need a different tax structure. We need uh, more uh, redistribution of tax resources from wealthier communities to poorer communities, from wealthier uh, parts of the state to uh, the places that have border-to-border -border poverty. But there also needs to be an awful lot of stuff done on the on the retail level that can't be done by the state. And some of it, I think you're even suggesting, can't be done by government. It has mm -hmm. to be done by, and this takes us back to that Tocqueville line you were talking about, about the huge number of voluntary associations mm -hmm. in the US. So last question for you is, you know, based on what you've learned, do you have any advice or recommendation for the leaders of organizations at the local level about how they can contribute to this? Yeah, um, well, um, I'm going to capture that in a slightly different frame because um, I uh, gave a 
talk to a, a religious magazine at one point and they asked like, you know, where do you start with this kind of work? And, and I answered just from the heart that you start where you want to start. And I feel like it's symbolic for you and I, we are around the corner from each other as we speak right now. Colleagues, you know, I work very little on litigation. Their Pam is, as you know, one of the most important litigators in the country. And, um, you know, we have picked where to make our mark. We didn't lay down under our desks. We picked what was our kind of space and we fought really hard to, you know, to show up for our challenges and our times. And I feel like that's what everybody in this book does is that they picked something and they started with it. And it's not all the same thing. You know, some people are really called to housing work. Some people are called to jobs work and so forth. And we don't even need to figure out why they just need to get to work. Um, and like you said, that's coming from the private sector, business leaders, church volunteers, um, uh, school teachers, and so on. Um, the last like takeaway, you know, you asked for leaders, and I would just say that um, Dan Rivera, who's this magnificent, um, was a magnificent mayor of Lawrence in the period that I was reporting on the book, um, he really described his sense of urgency as he began his job, knowing that the terrible headwinds up against his community, not only the opioid crisis, but incredibly entrenched poverty. And he, um, and he really took that kind of activist spirit of urgency. And at one point, I don't have the actual quote to hand, I wish I did, but at one point he said to me, um, you, you have to ask yourself, like, what are you gonna do every single day? And it's not one heroic project that solves everything, it's a thousand little things. And he really, at the beginning, he said he did an actual countdown of his mayoral administration. He said that got kind of old because it was a lot of days, but you know, he did this countdown to really remind himself, like, you've got to be moving progress along all kinds of different dimensions. And like you said, at all tiers of government at all times. So, well, we've come to the end of uh, this time. So our thanks to Michelle Wild Anderson, who's a professor of property, local government and environmental justice here at Stanford Law School and author of The Fight to Save the Town, Reimagining Discarded America. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Michelle's new book at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. I'm Pamela Carlin. Thank you for coming and take care. <laughs>